So Nancy, uh, I wanted to first talk to you about sleep and exercise. Mm. Yes. If you know, judging by how many of the women in this crowd are in the gym at 6 a.m., um, I'm sure that they feel like the sleep exercise thing is a little bit of a zero sum proposition. Um, and you know, in your personal life and and in your medical profession, how should we, when we have to choose between the two, how important is sleep? Should we ever choose exercise over sleep? Yes, yes, and yes. Um, you know, the great thing about having a bully pulpit is I get to tell people what to do, but I don't necessarily have to do it myself. <laughs> so um, I hate exercising, oh. uh, but I and tell people so to do good. it. Yeah, well, Spanx. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm a hiker. I'm a walker. I, I'm not a gym person, so I've had to find my exercise that makes me feel good about myself. So I like to hike. I do dressage which helps my core, and I love Pilates. So that's my exercise. And I have a TRX that I take with me everywhere, so in every hotel room I can at least do some things in the morning. If I do 10 or 15 minutes, I consider myself morally superior for the day. <laughs> um, but I am amazed by people who can do 45 minutes on the treadmill and then you know, get on with their day. And now I'm gonna give you my excuse. You know, I live in a hair and makeup world. It's an hour out of my day to, to do that. So I watch the boys at NBC you know, exercise and then run to their offices. Well, yeah, if I had a crew cut, I could do that too. But it, we don't have different luxuries. So I sneak it in when I can. I have gym shoes at work. I get out of the building every day. And I have learned that if I'm not needed at work, I get the hell out of Dodge. And then I incorporate my exercise but I have to fit it into my day. I don't do it as well at night because I'm usually pooped. However, I really do believe that sleep probably trumps exercise in longevity. And as we get older, skinny is not good. Strong is good, but you need a little fat on your bones because that keeps your hormone levels good and um, it keeps you from getting osteoporosis. Right. <laughs> So here's for the plus size woman. Okay, so everybody hit the snacks. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so we, speaking of snacks, we got a question from one of the attendees about sugar intake. She's mm. worried about, you know, she's got kids, she's worried about hidden sugar, she's worried about high fructose corn syrup. Um, how does she control her family's sugar intake? Is there kind of a number of grams she should be hitting? So the average American eats 100 pounds of sugar a year, um, which, I don't have to tell you, is too much. Um, the maximum you should have a day is 10 teaspoons. But here's the interesting thing that's happened within the span of our generation. We lost our brain's ability to tell what's sweet. When I was at Good Morning America years ago, Julia, Fran Julia Child and I were very good friends. And um, I cooked with Julia and I traveled with Julia and I watched Julia eat. Julia would have never put a fake sugar in her mouth. It was real sugar, but she didn't necessarily finish the meal. But it was all about being in the moment, in that presence with food, and I think that was one of Julia's great, great, great gifts. We now have artificial sweeteners. So if I give you sugar, which I think has been a sort of a much maligned entity, real just cane sugar, and I give you an aspartame, sugar will no longer seem sweet. So our brains have rewired the fact that we want sweeter things. So hence, even if you drink diet Coca-Cola, um, it does tell you that your brain that you like sweeter stuff. So we add more and more and more stuff on. I would argue that whenever you can get back to the purest stuff, you're better off. And that plain old sugar is sugar. And if you put sugar in a cup of coffee and it's not sweet enough, it's probably telling you that you've oversweetened your body and your brain. Um, now, am I a purist? No. I had two Diet Cokes yesterday and loved them. <laughs> <laughs> but it is all about moderation. And especially in the United States, we do extremes extraordinarily well. But we don't like to compromise and we don't talk, uh, talk about moderation. But there is certainly a way within the household to limit the amount of sugar, and that means you have to be a very, very good label reader. 40 grams is really the, the max, and you have to keep track of it. 
Is there anything, when you look at a food label, besides high fructose corn syrup, are there other ingredients that you should be looking out for? That's the one you hear about So a lot. now, yes, and there's a rule for high fructose corn syrup. The problem is it's not a necessary food group. Um, treats are treats. They aren't necessarily food groups. And I like treats. <laughs> But you have to you have to think about when you're eating a, a treat and what its purpose is. And I mean, look, nothing is better in most communities than tap water. And now we know our kids aren't even getting enough fluoride, and the dentists are seeing more cavities because everyone's living on bottled water. There's sort of a time culturally, I think you have to in medicine sort of go, okay, back to basics. Know your farmer. Turn on your tap. Go for a walk. What did we do in 1950s? We lived life pretty simply. And I think a lot of the complexities we're seeing in medicine, we brought on our, ourselves. Now, one last question from this mom. Are artificial sweeteners ever OK for kids? Would you recommend? I mean, I would be an absolute liar to tell you, uh, you know, they're, they're dreadful. And I've never done that to my children. Of course I have. They're, yeah. they're fine. OK. <laughs> but it's the moderation. I mean, it's, look, I. I'm very cognizant of the women who are in this room and the various um, companies that represent a big part of this industry. I mean, how dare I as a consumer, even as a physician, suddenly malign what is part of culture? But treats are treats, and food groups really are whole foods. We are better off if we eat primarily vegetables, um, fish, primarily the fatty fishes like tuna and salmon, minuscule amounts of red meat, lots of water, and uh, you can't OD on fruits and vegetables. And then frankly, you know what? I love my Oreo cookies. I would, <laughs> I would kill for them. Um, but I'll drink a glass of non-fat milk with them. Yeah. Well, you have, I mean, it, it's such a nice balance. It's a realistic approach it just, to living in the modern world. You can't be cuckoo about it. Right. Because let me tell you, I, I, my mother made homemade bread all the time. I sneaked up to Janet Weinrob's house because she got hostess white bread. <laughs> and I ate as much as I could. You think your kids aren't sneaking out at the neighbors? <laughs> of course they are. So don't deprive them. Just educate them as you feed them. <laughs> Okay, so you mentioned you know medicine today. We got another question about integrative medical practitioners. Yeah. Um, the question is, when dealing with chronic issues, sinusitis, allergies, immune system deficiencies, instead of a series of specialists, um, why does there continue to be a resistance to integrative health? Well, I don't think there is a resistance to integrative health. I think you have to be smart about how you find it. I was trained in pediatrics and then ear, nose, and throat surgery at the University of Pittsburgh. I went to the University of Arkansas for my first cancer um, job, and then I went to UC San Francisco and spent most of my academic time there, and now I'm on the East Coast. When I moved to California, patients came into my office on stuff, and I, of course, gave them very much my Western medicine approach to why all this stuff is junk, and my patients nodded accordingly, and then they went home and did whatever the hell they wanted to. So I thought, hmm, perhaps I have something to learn here. So I sort of took off my blinders, and living in California, you can't not become part of the integrated medicine um, scene. Problem is, I want people to prove to me that some things work and some things don't. Acupuncture, the power of prayer, massage, those things work. We've seen them for centuries. So I do think smart, good doctors believe that those aren't alternative things they're integrative. And it, even at you know, stuffy medical centers like Memorial Sloan Kettering or Stanford, UC San Francisco, Northwestern, there are teams of people who really are committed to practicing holistic medicine in the purest sense of the word. My only caution for anybody is there are people out there who are willing to sell you everything and anything, and not all of it works. So that gut an intellectual connection that we all have as women, but that we dissociate a lot of times, you should always have a gut check. Does it make sense to me? What's the science behind it? And 
it doesn't make sense. And a lot of times when you see people on air and they swear by a certain thing and that's why they look so good, it's because they're on their third facelift. It's not because <laughs> it's the stuff they put in their mouths. <laughs> so, so maintain just buyer cynicism. beware. <laughs> um, but if you, if you go to a doctor who does practice integrative medicine and they recommend something that is maybe not as traditional, yeah. And you're not sure it works. Should you try it and then go back if it doesn't work? I mean, it doesn't. I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I've, I used to think that acupuncture and acupressure. I wasn't sure about it. Then I watched it work, and I know it makes sense. Um, herbs are a little dicey. Uh, you don't necessarily know that the stuff in the bottle is as good as people say. And remember that everything you put in your mouth, whether it's a vitamin or an herb, has a possible downside. So if you go in for a procedure or something as simple as a colonoscopy, make sure you tell your doctor what you're on because it can affect bleeding and clotting and the anesthesia complications. So I think whether you take an herb or an aspirin or a statin, keep a list, make sure it makes sense, and I think one of the biggest problems right now is that people go to multiple doctors and nobody talks to each other. And so the patient ends up being sort of the central clearinghouse for all the information. And that's where mistakes are made. And sort of the least informed person of the group. Yeah, I mean, some ways the most informed because you know your body. Right. But your doctors, look, in the perfect world, the patient is the center. And then all the healthcare practitioners you have, including massage therapists and, and nurses, um, exercise people are on the outside. So you should be the central clearinghouse, but for medications and procedures, pick a doctor who really is going to be a good communicator and who will share information. Now I say that with the knowledge that HIPAA, this you know grand um, patient protection law that we have in the United States, has I think been one of the worst things to happen to patient care mm. because doctors really legally don't have the right to talk about you to the other doctor without your permission, and patients don't know to get that permission. Right. So you have to just constantly say, listen, everything needs to go through Dr. X. That's my person. And if doctors don't want to do that, divorce them. So we should all be saying that to our doctors Absolutely. then, proactively. You have to have a central, you have to have a central clearinghouse. Yeah. Okay. So speaking, you mentioned putting everything you put in your mouth. I want to ask you about two things mm. that we hear about a lot, vitamin D, mm. which I didn't even know existed until I learned I was deficient like four years ago. Most white, um, and most white deficient, girls are. Right? Yeah. Um, and baby aspirin. Right. So we've gotten questions about both of those. So I take both of those. Um, I've gone through the years of trying different things, multivitamins, vitamin E, vitamin D, Bs, whatever, and I think I've just given myself expensive urine. So... <laughs> um, <laughs> Plus, I can't, you know, I couldn't remember. Too bad you can't monetize yeah. that, right? <laughs> I, mm. You know, there's probably something mm. in that. Mm. Straining urine. Mm. And, um, you know, I, why do you think IUDs work? Because people can't remember to take birth control pills. So th there has to be a regimen that makes sense for you. And then, frankly, for some things, it's an everyday thing. For other people, you sort of use it when you can. I have a regimen that works for me, knowing exactly what my risk factors are. I have a risk factor for heart disease because, yes, in the 60s, I did inhale, and I've had one too many cheeseburgers. <laughs> so I know that I have some heart disease. Because of that, I take statin and I take a baby aspirin. I also um, am not out in the sun enough because, of course, I slather my skin with you know, SPF 40 so I won't get skin cancer, but I no longer absorb vitamin D from the sun. So my thing now Wait, is... Wait, I'm sorry, because you wear sunscreen? I wear sunscreen. So oh. I block out the vitamin D from Got the sun. It. Okay. The best way to get your vitamin D is spend 20 minutes in the sun every day, and you'll probably be okay, but most of us don't do it. So I try to go 20 minutes daily with no sunscreen, with a hat on, my arms out. And um, then I take vitamin D, and I take a baby aspirin. Um, however, as we know, you know, you can have major strokes and bleeds, so... If you're concerned at all about the fact that you already don't clot well, um, a baby aspirin might not be for you. Most strokes are because we throw a clot. 20% of strokes are because we blow a vessel and have a major bleed. I do believe in the power of aspirin. I, however, do not think it should be taken without your doctor knowing about it. It's okay. a real medicine. 
but vitamin D, any risk factors there? Uh, or very little. To two, two, uh, you know, I think it's 2,000 units for most women. I take 4,000 units right now because I'm, I'm really low. Um, and I just want strong bones. If you, know, if you do anything, weight-bearing exercise, walking, hiking, resistance training, um, stuff in the pool is fun. However, it's not going to do anything for you to keep your bones strong. Stronger your muscles, the stronger your bones, the less your risk of getting osteoporosis and snapping a hip as a little old lady. And then the more you sort of think about curing yourself up like this, the less you're going to have to cheat when they do your height in the doctor's office and you're on your tiptoes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. We're out of You're time. Welcome. Everybody sit up in your chair. <laughs> yeah, right? I know. That is your cue like from her. Because I cr Christian. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you're staying up here. Okay. And, uh, and thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs>